The Boeing B-47 Stratajet was the perfect strategic weapon for its time, so feared by its enemies that the bomber never had to perform its lethal nuclear mission. The Soviet leadership knew the B-47, swiftly deployed in ever greater numbers, gave the United States an unstoppable nuclear strike force. Sadly, the B-47 also suffered losses on a scale that would be utterly intolerable today. Over its lifetime, 203 aircraft, about 10% of the total procured, were lost in crashes, with 464 deaths. There were a number of reasons for this doleful toll. The Stratajet introduced a new flight performance regime requiring new skills and greater precision. It was a hybrid of World War II metallurgy, construction techniques, and aerodynamic theory that was sometimes inadequate for the new era of jet engines. From its very first flight, USAF tried to maximize the B-47's effectiveness with ever greater demands for performance, flexibility, and mobility. Perhaps most important, the bomber debuted at a time when Strategic Air Command was undergoing an explosive expansion in size that diluted standardization efforts and the effectiveness of training and safety procedures. After four years of intensive development, the XB-47A made its first flight on December 17, 1947, one of two prototypes built under a $10 million contract. It was the product of Boeing's expertise, and the information engineer George S. Scherer garnered from captured German data on swept wings and high-speed flight. The prototype was so radical that one of its primary engineers, Holden Withington, was still not certain it would fly as he watched it taxi out for its first takeoff. The XB-47 featured slender, shoulder-mounted swept wings. A huge bubble canopy housed the fighter-like cockpit for the pilot and co-pilot gunner. The Navigator Bombardier radar operator was tucked away in the nose and in later models had no outside visibility at all. Six General Electric engines were mounted, for an inboard underwing pods and two near the wingtip. The bicycle landing gear previously tested by Martin on AB-26 and the XB-48 was adopted because the thin wing provided no storage space. The selection of the ultra-thin wing created both structural and aerodynamic problems. It had to be built with great strength to withstand huge deflections, as much as 17 feet in flight. But it was also flexible cord-wise, so that at speeds above 489 miles per hour, the ailerons acted as a tab, twisting the wings rather than inducing a bank. At 525 miles per hour, the ailerons were totally ineffective, and the control wheel could not budge from side to side. Ironically, during B-47 development, the Boeing engineers discovered a thin wing was not absolutely necessary and designed the B-52 with huge thick wings and ample fuel storage. Flying the aircraft at approach and landing speeds was demanding because the engines were so slow to accelerate. A drogue parachute was used to allow approach and landings to be made with the engine still carrying enough power to enable rapid throttle movement. After landing, a 32-foot brake parachute and an anti-skid brake stopped the aircraft. The 1953 National Security Council Document 162-2 called explicitly for maintenance of a strong military force, emphasizing the capability of inflicting massive retaliatory damage by offensive striking power. Strategic Air Command became that force. SAC embarked on unprecedented peacetime growth in strength and proficiency. From 1951, when the B-47 arrived in the force, to 1957, SAC expanded from 144,525 personnel to 224,014. It grew from 12 to 1,285 B-47S. To support this aerial team, SAC swiftly set up a tremendous infrastructure of new Air Force bases. As the pell-mell re-equipment of SAC with B-47S went forward, there were errors in component supplies, training, and operational procedures. From 1953 to 1959, B-47S suffered two 96 Class A and Class B mishaps, resulting in 242 fatalities. In 1957 alone, there were 35 Class A and Class B accidents, 
of these 24 were crashes that cost 63 lives. Almost as deadly was 1,958, there were 33 Class A and Class B accidents, with 25 aircraft crashed and 58 fatalities. Most crashes came down to human error, with pilots assigned principal blame. There were many reasons for this. The three-man crew flew a vastly more complicated aircraft than the ten-man crews of the B-29 or B-50. It was easy for any crewman, particularly the aircraft commander, to have his attention diverted momentarily from the task of flying the aircraft. Most importantly, missions sometimes ran 24 hours. Crew coordination was essential and could be easily disrupted when an emergency occurred. Yet attention to flight control was absolutely critical at all times. The extremely clean lines of the B-47 enabled its performance and problems. A pilot concentrating on a new situation might let his attention wander for a few seconds and find himself banking in a dive that pushed his speed to a point where recovery was impossible. This proved to be a frequent scenario during instrument flight. The B-47 required much closer attention than the previous aircraft to pre-flight planning, fuel distribution, trim settings, and airspeed control. It was deceptively easy to fly, but the extremely precise operation was required during takeoff, in-flight refueling, instrument flight, and landing. This became even more important with new tactics that included higher takeoff weights, minimum interval takeoffs, three ship cells for in-flight refueling, tankers with marginal performance, and operation from alternate airfields. These new requirements increased demands on the relatively new B-47 and its crews. More powerful engines, water injection, and jet-assisted takeoff bottles offset an increase in gross weight from 125,000 pounds in the B-47A to 206,700 in the B-47E. But, these combined increased the strain on wings and fuselage. One of the most important changes was at the end of 1957. SAC decided that the B-47 was already obsolescent. With a ceiling of about 40,000 feet and a maximum speed of 600 miles per hour, it could not likely penetrate the increasingly sophisticated radar, anti-aircraft missile, and fighter defenses that ringed the Soviet Union. So the B-47S were ordered to practice the Hair Clipper training program for low-level flight and the use of the LABS, which is low-altitude bombing system maneuvers, better known as toss bombing. The planes would approach enemy airspace at an extremely low altitude, using the landscape and curvature of the Earth to block defensive radar. Once near their target, the planes would pull up sharply and simulate the release of a nuclear bomb, which presumably would continue in a long forward arc. It would have to climb into a backwards half-loop followed by a half-roll, as though it were a fighter plane. Enormous stress was placed on the center wing section, which of course was not designed for acrobatics. Within a few months of such training, B-47S were routinely disintegrating, forcing Hair Clipper to cancel on March 5, 1958. There were also several toss bombing techniques, all dangerous. In the pop-up maneuver, the B-47 would fly in at 489 miles per hour indicated airspeed until some 60 seconds prior to bombs away, then climb to 3,500 feet above the ground, level off, drop the parachute retarded bomb, and make an immediate turn to escape. The general strain on the aircraft structures caused by the stress of atmospheric turbulence at low altitudes was exacerbated by a higher tempo of operations. This required more frequent refueling missions and increased numbers of takeoffs and landings. The much redacted crash reports of 1956 to 1957 are a sobering litany of human error and design difficulties. Some of the accidents were inexplicable. There were two accidents where the aircraft commander was not physically fit to fly, and in another, a crew elected to attempt a takeoff even though they in ground control knew their right outrigger tire was blown. Many of the accidents occurred on takeoff, all with a similar pattern. The high gross weight takeoffs appeared normal until a few seconds after liftoff. Then a wing dipped, struck the runway, and the aircraft crashed and burned. Analysis revealed a loss of power that induced yaw. 
When this happened, the B-47 entered a stall, and a crash was unavoidable. Takeoff crashes also resulted from incorrect pre-flight planning. In one instance, the aircraft commander failed to include the weight of 2,200 gallons of external fuel in his calculations, rotated too soon, stalled, and crashed. In another, the crew set the elevator trim incorrectly because it used an outdated manual. The Air Force was concealing the dimensions and implications of the B-47 story, which leaked out in dribs and drabs over subsequent decades. In fact, planes were being lost as early as 1951. The first officially acknowledged Madeira explosion came in 1952. In 1955, just a few months after Jimmy Stewart in Strategic Air Command called the B-47, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life, two exploded in Madeira, one over Texas and another over Kansas. In 1957, 27B-47S blew up or crashed. 31 pilots were lost in 1958. Dozens of crewmen died in those 58 disasters in just these two years. In 1980, the Air Force approved the public release of the History of the Aircraft Structural Integrity Program, a report that revealed previously classified information about a series of catastrophic B-47 accidents in early 1958 that immobilized the entire B-47 fleet, thus causing a national crisis. Especially shocking was this revelation. On April 4, the Air Research and Development Command agreed that continued, unrestricted operation of the B-47 fleet was hazardous. If SAC had acted on this recommendation, B-47 would not have blown up six days later. The day after this tragic event, the Air Force banned all B-47S from flying faster than two-thirds of its top speed. Even then, the crashes continued. On April 25, ten days after the flight restrictions were imposed, another B-47 exploded in flight. Instead of grounding all B-47S, the Air Force ordered all of the planes that had not been inspected for cracks to fly no faster than half their top speed and imposed additional strict restrictions. Besides, things could have been worse. Although the Air Force has always been reluctant to acknowledge the presence of nuclear weapons in accidents, we now know that between 1956 and 1958, thermonuclear weapons were jettisoned, destroyed, or lost in at least eight separate incidents of B-47S. In some cases, the high explosive charges designed to initiate critical mass detonated, spreading radiation or causing injuries on the ground. For a time, the B-47's high performance and diligent crews provided the United States with an overwhelming strategic advantage, but the experience was sobering. SAC learned from it. It vastly improved training and flying safety procedures, and the B-52 Stratofortress quickly became the Air Force's principal nuclear bomber. In a sense, B-47 laid a solid foundation for the later successful B-52 Stratofortress. This is all for today's video. If you like our content, drop a like below, subscribe to our channel, and see you in the next episode.